Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. All right, I want to talk about something uh, important tonight. It's always important. But I think it's important for now. Um, there's a verse in, in the book of Proverbs, and this is what that verse says. As iron sharpens iron, so one man, now I've added in there so everybody's included, so one man, woman, boy, girl, sharpens another. As iron sharpens iron, so one man, woman, boy, girl, sharpens another. Now, let, let me tell you some of um, the issues and a little problem with that. Um, in the King James Version of the Bible, and the New King James, and one or two other versions, it says that iron sharpens iron, uh, and so a friend sharpens another. Now, that word friend is nowhere in there. Uh, it's the mischief that's added that in, because the suggestion is that if what's happening to you is not being done by a friend, you don't have to pay any attention to it because it's only what happens between friends that causes you to be sharpened. So basically, you can have a different attitude to anything that happens to you from anyone who's not your friend. That's not what the Bible says. That's a distortion of the text. This is more accurate to the text. As iron sharpens iron, so one man, any man, woman, boy, girl, sharpens another. Now, the point here is not... Sharper knives, swords, and meat skewers. Okay, this is not the point of this verse. It's about sharper lives and sharper people. And the whole issue is God wants us to be people who have sharper lives because we are sharper peoples. Sharpening iron is the carefully chosen parallel used to illustrate what is necessary to achieve that. If you want a sharper life... If you want to be a sharper person, this is the process that's necessary to become that. I think what, it, what he means by a sharpened life is really one that has an edge. Sharpening is all about having an edge. It's about equipping it to cut through the nonsense, the challenges, the circumstances, the adversaries, all the things that we face in life that if you don't have an edge, you can't cut through them and you become aware that you are not cutting through them. You hack away, you work away, you swing away at them, but somehow you never get the breakthrough, you never cut through what it is that needs to be cut through, and that's really what this verse, although it's in an ancient book of the Bible, is all about, it's about sharpening you and what's necessary to achieve that. So, um, if we don't submit to the process that he describes here that sharpens us, then the truth is we remain dull or we remain blunt. I, I like the fact that the, the, the technical phrase that's used for a blunt edge is dull, right? Dull. And really, that's what dull people are. Dull people are people who don't have an edge. They're not cutting through anything anymore. They're not able to make their way. And life becomes dull because we have a dull edge. It's a wonderful old English phrase. When, a blunt, uh, when an edge is blunt, it's called dull. And so if we don't submit to the process that sharpens us, the truth is we will remain dull or blunt and unable to cut through into the things that are necessary for our natural and spiritual well-being. We're often far too guilty of just letting life do what life does and we just kind of go along with it as if we'd been chucked into a river with a life belt around us and wherever the river flows, we go. That's not the kind of life that the Bible talks about. It's not the kind of life that God wants you to have. Jesus described the life that he wants you to have. He called it, in, in, in the old English, it's life more abundant. Well, that's not a word we use much now, abundant, do we? We would rather say something like life to the full or living life extravagantly, which doesn't mean life with more money or a bigger house. It means that that's something inside of you that needs to be satisfied, that needs to be released, that needs to have peace and joy and contentment and momentum and hope and faith. 
That's what it's talking about when it says Jesus came that we might have life to the full. So the danger is for all of us that, that we just let life carry us along. And so you therefore get whatever life serves you up. Now I personally believe, and I believe it with all my heart, that we do not have to simply accept what it is that life serves us up. Now, that doesn't mean that we will never be sick or never have a financial need or, or never have a worry or never have a concern, but it means that in the midst of all that, there is a power, there is a strength, there is something that happens in the heart and life and mind of the believer, those who believe that he is who he says he is and that you are who you say you are, that begins to have an effect and an impact upon the circumstances of life. Now, we use the word circumstance, which is very interesting because I've explained this to you before. Some of you will remember it. Circumstance is made up of two words, circum and stance, right? Circum meaning something that surrounds you that is a circle and stance meaning where you stand. So a circumstance is simply a circle in which you stand. So if you're crazy enough to stay standing in the circum, you will be the victim of your circum stance. Now, I believe that the message of Jesus was to deliver us from circumstance. We stand in a different place when we stand in the grace of God and the love of God and the favor of God. So when our hope and our faith and our love tends towards that, something gets pulled in that bursts us out of our circumstance. Now, I also have to say human nature is such that most of us don't want to be outside our circumstance. Because although it can be difficult, though it can be problematic, we actually have some kind of perverted security because it's what we know. It's what we're familiar with. And we think that because of that, we might as well stay there. And we, we, ha we have developed terms like the lesser of two evils. We've developed terms like better the devil you know than the devil you don't know. Well, how about having no devil? How about getting the devil out of the whole thing? How about not the lesser of two evils, but the greater of two goods? I'm beginning to step into another arena of our faith reaching out because what I'm not wanting you to be is a group of people who come to church because you're just trying to survive. I want you to be here because you're alive and because you thrive. And that's what verses like this are all about. So if we don't submit to the process that sharpens us, we remain dull or blunt, unable to cut through and into the things that are necessary for our natural and spiritual well-being. Now, I don't believe natural and spiritual are separate things. I actually think they're all one thing. But I have to explain it that way so some of you understand. You know, for some of you, when I say spiritual, it's prayers and hymns and, and church. And natural, it's work and family and jobs. So I explain it that way because what I want you to know, actually, they're not divided. The two are one. They're all tied together. But if you understand in both of those realms, which actually are one, this is where God wants us to work and he wants us to be sharp in our life. So, um, I think what he means by a sharpened life is one that is as, as the edge, equipping us to cut through the nonsense and challenges and circumstances and adversities of life. And that if we do not submit to the process that sharpens us, we remain dull or blunt and unable to cut through into the things that are necessary for our natural and spiritual well-being. And that a sharpened life is not a consequence of the natural process of life, but the result of how and if we engage with the sharpening process. So your life is not going to become sharp and have an edge naturally. It's just not, okay? There, there is, a, there is a, a, a law of the universe, and the laws of the universe are very, very interesting. But the second law, is it the second law of thermodynamics? The second law of thermodynamics, don't ask me what the first one is. Ask me next week what the first one is. The second law of thermodynamics is what we know as the law of entropy. The law of entropy says that unless life is introduced, everything deteriorates into chaos. Or in other words, unless there is a reversal of the natural process, you cannot avoid that everything will deteriorate into chaos or, or sink into death. 
You see, here's where the wonder of the gospel is, why Jesus rose from the dead to break the second law of thermodynamics and say the law of entropy gets lost in the, spirit, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus because instead of everything deteriorating into chaos, when you truly find the life that is in Christ, everything ascends into life and order. Not chaos, it goes the other way. It comes into order, doesn't go into chaos. So it's very important that we find the principle that overcomes what would be the natural process and why I say to you that a sharpened life is not the consequence of a natural process. You have to engage with the sharpening process and if you don't, then you get the natural thing, okay? As I said to you about circumstance, it's far too easy for our lives to simply become compliant to the status quo or the case sera sera, whatever will be will be in Spanish, and nothing changes with us or is changed by us if we live in the status quo and the case sera sera, but let's face it, that's where most of us live most of the time, the status quo, this is what it is, case sera sera, whatever will be, will be, I don't believe that that is what we are bound to, I believe these laws that are being spoken here are what free us from that situation. Truth is little, if any change, and this is important, I've, I've said this for years, little, if any change, ever occurs in our life in the absence of crisis. I don't know, I don't know many organizations, if any, or many people, um, or many families, or many businesses, in all honesty, that actually change in the absence of crisis. It's usually crisis that stimulates us to action, which is pretty sad really, isn't it? But it also says, therefore, what we need more in our life than anything else is crisis, because crisis stimulates us to action. The problem is, instead of letting the crisis be the stimulant to action that makes our life sharp and moves us on, what usually happens is we let the, the, the crisis be the pressure that causes us to accept the status quo, the case sera sera, and we don't realize what is happening. Crisis is good for us. If you, if you study the life of Jesus at all, you will find that he was persistently causing crisis in people's lives. Finding where their equilibrium was, finding where their foundation was, and then just undermining that a little bit. If you were the rich young ruler, He's going to say, I'm glad you made lots of money. It's fantastic. Why don't you bless the temple? No. He says, if you want to be what you're supposed to be, go sell all you have, give to the poor, and love treasure in heaven. See, it's a crisis being created because he knows no change is going to come without crisis. So uh, if you're like me, we don't embrace crisis very well. But if we would only see that it's actually the doorway to a new day, then it would produce a different result in us. Outside of crisis is the problem. The comfort afforded by familiarity and the cost of potentially having to make radical changes ensure that we either insulate ourselves against the challenge or remove ourselves from it. When the going gets tough, the tough go. What often happens is that in situations, and I'm, I'm going to explain how this comes personally to us, when, when the iron begins to want to sharpen iron in the process of our life, we either insulate ourselves to it because we don't want it to feel like it's supposed to feel. We want to lessen its impact upon our lives, but in lessening its impact, we actually lessen or, 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 or miss its impact, okay? We have got to expose ourselves to its influence. So, so the truth is, we, we, we get, familiarity is another interesting thing. We, we, we get so bound by familiarity. This is a disease, particularly of the church, probably in a wider life, but I've spent all my life in the church, familiarity. We feel comfortable because of familiarity. And uh, when things change, and things change consistently, it causes crisis, it causes upset. When our, when our thinking and our, our beliefs and, and, and what we thought we'd, we'd understood are being challenged, it causes crisis, and our tendency is to go back to that which is familiar. 
And yet we really need to make some radical changes, not insulate ourselves, nor remove ourselves from it. Because the other interesting thing we do as people is just move. We go away from the thing that's our crisis. We think if we run away from it, life will be better. When actually I believe a lot of those crises were stimulated by God for the purpose of our lives being changed forever. So if we're left to our natural process, we're more likely to become bitter, distant, and offended than mature and competent when we are challenged with the iron sharpens iron. And I want that to be different for you and totally different for me. We're more likely to try and avoid or escape the sharpening process than we are to submit to it. And there is a reason for this. And this is the reason why we try to avoid or escape the sharpening process rather than submit to it. Because the key element in the process of sharpening is friction. Friction. Boy, we don't like friction. We like everybody to be happy, everything to be at peace. We don't want a crossed word. We don't want a crossed understanding. We don't want any contrary beliefs. We don't want anything that upsets the apple cart. So we never get sharp because you can't sharpen iron without friction. But what none of us want is friction. But what all of us want is to be sharpened. But you see, you can't be one without the other. So the question is, are you prepared to submit yourself to the process of friction in order to re receive the reward of sharpness in your life? Now we'll talk a little bit about how that comes to us in just a moment. The sharpening is the result of friction and only that. Okay, It's the only thing that produces sharpness. Now friction is created when things move in close proximity to each other. Okay? So you can't be sharpened by distancing yourself from a person, from your thinking, from your challenges, from the situation. You can't be sharpened by doing that because if you remove steel from the place that causes friction, it doesn't get sharp. And so we can live our lives never sharpening, never cutting through, never becoming what we're supposed to become because we don't understand that for you to be sharpened, you have to be in close proximity to the thing that is sharpening you. Friction is created when things move in close proximity to each other. People are a classic example of that. How many of you have never had any friction when you're moving close proximity to a person? If you have, I'd like to know your secret. And then my challenge would be you've never been in close proximity to a person in your life. Because if you had you'd realize that naturally produces friction. And here's what this ancient wisdom says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man, woman, boy, girl sharpens another. How does that happen? It happens by the friction that is created through our closeness together. So if you thought that friction is a sign you should not be together, you misread the situation. Friction is a good sign that you are being sharpened because you are close enough to feel the heat from that friction, that if you will allow it to do what it does, it will sharpen you and you will have an edge. So, sharpening is the result of friction and only that. Friction is created when things move in close proximity to each other. But here's the deal, you need to know this, if you haven't figured this out, it produces heat, it produces sparks, and it produces fire. If you're serious about getting your life sharp and in the place where you can meaningfully cut through the issues that you face, then the sparks are going to fly at some point. There's going to be a fire here or there in the right circumstances. I'll guarantee you there's definitely going to be heat because you can't produce friction without friction producing heat and often sparks 
and fire. The thing is that there is a purpose, okay? You've got to get that in your heart. There is a purpose. There's a purpose for the heat. There's a purpose for the sparks. There's a purpose for the fire. The purpose is that you are going to come out of this with an edge. You're going to come out of this sharp. You're going to come out of this able to cut through circumstances. You're going to come out of this able to be different and do some good and change some things. Now, having said that, Dave Craven and some of my uh, engineering friends will know this, that that some form of lubricant or coolant is essential between the moving parts to make the process produce power rather than break down. Um, my father-in-law used to tell me when you're dealing with situations that we're getting hot because of the friction of two people, you needed to remember to dip the situation in water every now and again. So I don't believe that sometimes these pressures are ones that we shouldn't step away from for a little while because sometimes you've got to cool the heat that's going on but then you come back again to the point because you realize what this is actually trying to produce in your life is something amazing and something good and if you'll stay the course then you will have an edge in life. So if we need some form of lubricant or coolant... Uh, to produce power rather than breakdown. Because here's what's happening. When, when two parts are moving together and there is friction, if you have no lubrication, what ultimately happens is that the surface of one or both of those parts will gradually melt and then they will fuse together. In a, in a petrol engine, uh, we call that seizing. The engine seized, which is what happened. It seized. There was no lubricant to deal with the friction, so it seized up. And that can happen in this process with us. But God has provided something. that it's, it's not by chance that the Holy Spirit, who is the third part of this expressed thing that we call God, is described as oil. Okay? Because oil has lots of significances in, in, in ancient understanding. Uh, one is oil was used to express that you, were, you had been favored and blessed and appointed. And we still, we still in some cultures anoint kings. And it comes, from, it comes from this era, this biblical era, which said there is, it's like a spirit that comes over you that empowers you to be who you're supposed to be. But of course, the, the other reason that oil is used is because oil is a great lubricator. And uh, Having an awareness that the Holy Spirit, God himself in the form of the Spirit, is at work with us and in us and through us and for us. When we get into these heated situations and when the friction begins to build, what it does, it creates a film between us that allows some movement to take place. So we don't fuse, we heal. And you see, an engine runs at an incredibly high temperature. Your car engine... Don't go and test this tonight, you know, by driving home and then lifting your bonnet and sticking your hand on the engine block. But if you've ever lifted the bonnet of your car, or even a motorbike, whatever you ride, uh, after you've driven, you'll realize heat comes out at you. That heat has been caused by the friction of the engine, but the engine hasn't seized because it's allowing the oil to do its work. It's not resisting each other. It's working with each other. And so in spite of that... And the heat that is there, what happens is that the oil is allowing the engine to produce power instead of breakdown. Now, I propose to you that when the friction comes in our lives in situations and we understand and ask for and allow the presence of the Holy Spirit within that context, it produces power and not breakdown. We realize that what's coming out of us is not a lack of strength, but an increase of strength because of that oil being present. Now, I also believe that plenty of grace will do that as well. I think you've got plenty of grace working between us and in your situation and in your life and where the friction comes on, that works as well. I also believe faith, hope and love do it as well. And we have a good dose of faith and hope and love working in that. It turns the friction into power rather than breakdown. I could also say what we talked about some weeks ago, the fruit of the Spirit will also do that. And these are things that if you will keep them at the forefront in there, as you face the friction, you will come out sharp and the heat will turn to power, not to break down. I have to say that everything other than those things I've described to you oppose that process and they'll cause your engine to cease. Now let me say what, you know, some of these things that cause the 
friction between us. It, 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 it can be positive, it could be negative, it can be confrontational, it can be observational, conversations that happen, things that are done, uh, the ways we think people should have and shouldn't have done it, and we get all our knickers in a twist over, you know, you shouldn't and wouldn't and couldn't, because we haven't understood that as iron sharpens iron, so one man, woman, boy, girl sharpens another. So we fail to appreciate when we're in those situations. Why? Because there's heat, because there's sparks, because there might be some fire. We fail to realize that here is an opportunity for my life to be sharpened. For me to walk away from this, not with offense and wounds, but to walk away from this empowered and equipped to cut through life and break out of my circumstances. And it's all by how we apply ourselves to that process of sharpening. If we avoid or try to protect ourselves from this process, the inevitable outcome is a dulling effect on the senses, certainly on the ones that really matter. The bits of your spirit, your senses that really matter, if we don't try to protect ourselves from this, they get dulled. And what happens is we get an intensifying of the feelings that don't bring us life, like acute, an acute sense of unfairness, like distrust, like offense, like bitterness, like unforgiveness, are all things that come out of them encounters that actually could have produced an edge, could have produced life, but because we didn't understand and embrace the process, we have our senses dulled to the truth of that, and then we just come out of it feeling that was unfair, I can't trust anybody, I'm offended, a bitter unforgiveness, all that stuff. So the truth is we need friction. How many of you say yes? None. If you've got any sense, you say no. But if you're living in reality, you say, yep, I get it, I understand, it works. And it does work. Okay? It does work. We need friction. Now I want to just introduce this principle through another angle just for a few minutes that I think will be important for this house in our unfolding future. So I've just shared with you a very personal word for all of you. As iron sharpens iron, so one, a man, woman, boy, girl sharpens another and I hope that you grasp some understanding and you will say right okay just because there's friction just because there's heat just because there's fire what that's telling me is that there's a sharpening process here there's an opportunity to be sharpened I'm gonna let the oil of the Holy Spirit I'm gonna let love joy and peace and those things invade me that's gonna produce the lubrication and I'm gonna come out of this with an edge right that cuts me out of my circumstances so I begin to live in the life that is more abundant and full in the favor of God, which is the promise to you. But now I want to talk just a little bit about something that I think will be important for this house in our unfolding future. And so I've done the unintentional version rather than the new international version of this verse. This is the unintentional version. And you'll find this in Anth Verbs chapter 1 and verse 1. As iron... I-O-N, sharpens iron, I-O-N, so one man, woman, boy, girl, sharpens another. We drop the R. It's not I-R-O-N anymore, it's I-O-N. You say, what's the significance of that? Let me explain to you. I-O-N is a very important part of our language, a critical part that we use all the time, mostly in the Latin words within our language, the Latin-based words, but it has massive significance, just like as iron sharpens iron, I-R-O-N sharpens I-R-O-N, so iron, I-O-N, sharpens I -O iron, I-O-N, in our lives. Here's what you need to understand. I-O-N added, added onto the end of words is done so in order to denote action or condition which moves the word from the sterility of a statement to the active. So it takes something from the sterility of being a statement into it being active. It's added on, it denotes that action or condition. Ion on iron, ION on ION 
is the friction created by going from knowing to doing. And believe me, there is a friction created going from knowing to doing. That's why Jesus one day said, he that hears my words and does them is like the man who builds his house on a rock. Who when the storms come, when the circumstances are adverse, when the waves are beating, the house stands because the circumstances are not dictating the state of the house. He who does my, hears my words and does them. But he says, but he who hears my words and does not do them is like the man who built his house on the sand. He has no foundational base. So when the storm comes and the waves beat and the wind blows, that house ultimately collapses and has to be completely and totally rebuilt. However many times you have to do that because it's totally subject to the circumstances because it's built on the wrong thing. What it's built on is not the issue of sand or rock. That's just the illustration. What it's built on is the hearing or the doing. Now here's the difference. To be religious, you only have to hear what the Bible says, what you think God says. But when you become a follower of Jesus, you become a doer of that. Now, again, that's a deep subject and a wide subject and a broad subject that should not put condemnation and burden on anybody because Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden's light. Just learn of me and you'll be okay. And let me tell you, you will be okay because this stuff is not judgmental or condemning. But there is an issue of going from knowing to doing, where what we thought we know, we now begin to do. We have been on a process in this house of actually changing our knowing. And I am thankful for that, because there's a lot of my knowing that needed to change. But we're also on a process that if all we've changed is our knowing, and we haven't changed our doing, we don't become any sharper than we were before because as ION sharpens ION, so one man, woman, boy, girl sharpens another. Let me illustrate, then going from knowing to doing, let me illustrate the word changing it from sterile to active. Create becomes creation. See? Create which is a going to create, becomes creation. Now it's become an action. It's become something you see, something you experience. Commune becomes communion. So rather than just having a commune together, we now have communion among us. I-O-N, sharpening us. I-O-N, making the difference. But as my time is gone, I'll give you just two more. Motive becomes motivation. Instead of just having a, a motive, now you have a motivation which has become an action. It's become an outworking. And so here in the context of this house and probably the most significant and recurring word related to this in our journey at this time is that quest becomes question. The action demanded by a quest. The action demanded by a quest is a question. When you start to put the ION on there and let it sharpen your ION, it means that your life moves into the place of question so that you can address the issues that you face in honesty and integrity so that in that manifestation of honesty and integrity, you find you are actually accomplishing a quest. You are pursuing a quest. You are fulfilling a quest. Our life is meant to be a quest. A quest for the kingdom of God to be manifest in the earth. It's not a quest to be good. It's not a quest to see how much Bible you can learn. It's not a quest to see how many hours you can pray. It's not a quest to see how, many, how pious you can be. It's not a quest to see how better you can be than anybody else. It's a quest to see the kingdom of heaven showing up in the earth. That's the circumstance breaker. It's living under a new strength and a new power. As Jesus said, your kingdom come, you will be done here on earth like it is in heaven. So the core element in this is not the question, 
but the quest. But when the quest becomes a question, iron, I-O-N, sharpens iron, I-O-N. And suddenly the quest has an edge and becomes effective. So I've done two things tonight. One, you know what I've done. One, you don't really know what I've done, but you will know what I've done in due course, and it was necessary for me to do it because it's important to sow this into your spirit on these two angles. So here's my challenge to you. Let iron sharpen iron. I-R-O-N sharpen I-R-O-N, and you will have an edge. Okay? If I am irritating you by what I'm saying tonight, good. Because there's just a possibility that in that friction, somebody might get, sharpen if you're like well you know then somehow we detach somehow we're not connecting something has to connect that causes iron to sharpen iron and you will have the edge to deal with the circumstances of life and you will have a breakthrough and you will have a breakout and you will see a change and you will see a difference because your life has an edge but I also want to say let iron ion Sharpen iron, I-O-N. Because when we do that, we move, from, we move from the words to the action. We move from knowing to doing. We activate ourselves fully and engage fully in the process of where God is leading us and what God is making us. So I plead with you tonight, embrace the process, iron sharpening iron. And join the quest, iron, I-O-N sharpening ION. If you put those two things together, I believe you have a great future as an individual. I believe you have a great present as an individual. And I believe we have a great present and a great future as a house of people, as a group of people. We're not a commune, we are communion. Okay? We not just create, we are a creation. Okay? We don't just have a motive, we have motivation. And we don't just have a quest, but we have a question, and that question is bringing us to sharpness by the grace of God. Okay, let's just pray together. Father, I pray for every life in here tonight, every heart, every mind, every soul, every spirit, every body, that as we share these things, that, that there will be a, a grasping in the understanding and an embracing in the spirit that cause us not to withdraw ourselves and pull back or insulate ourselves from the very things that are present in our life right now to give us the edge and to make us sharp and to bring us to a place of freedom and deliverance. I pray a release in every spirit in Jesus' name. I pray that fear will be broken in every heart, the fear of breaking away from the status quo, the fear of que sera, sera, that whatever will be, will be. I break those lies tonight, Jesus, in your name that binds so many people to realize that we have a new dawn, we have a new day. We have a new experience. We have resurrection. We have the life of God flowing through us. We have life in all its fullness right at our fingertips. But the life of that is coming very often through as iron sharpens iron. So we sharpen one another. Help us to be tolerant, engaging, loving, kind, faithful, considerate, to each other in that process, knowing that you will bring us as a group, as a people, also to a place of corporate sharpness. So our desire is that we be changed and we change our world, that your kingdom come and your will be done here on earth like it is in heaven. So we honor you. We thank you for your love towards us. Thank you that none of this stuff is about earning your love and your kindness. It's about living in the love and kindness that you've already given towards us, and we accept that tonight with gratefulness. In Jesus' name, amen. So now you have a problem. Everybody that irritates you is probably the iron that's sharpening your iron. Everybody that causes heat and friction now, let me say, that doesn't mean, you know, an abused wife should just accept abuse from a husband. We're not talking about that. That takes it to the extreme. But that can still be an opportunity to be sharpened. That can still be a way 
to find life. And some of you have been in difficult situations like that where you found when you engage correctly, it brought you life. So I'm not saying that, you know, we, we'd be stupid, but what I am saying is that we do understand the process. And within the process, for most of us, it's the normalities of life. It's not those extremes that we resist rather than saying, do you know what? So sharpening me, I'm going to go through this. And the Holy Spirit's going to put some lubrication in there. We're going to be just fine and cool. When we come out of this, we have a sharp, we're going to have an edge. And we are equipped then as people. We're equipped for people. We're equipped to people. And uh, maybe we can make a difference in our world. So bless you. Have we got a... I'm going to do the offering. All right, so if the guys can come be ready, we're going to do the pay it forward, and then we're about done. For those of you who are always regulars on Wednesday night, don't forget what we said about Wednesday night this week. Other than that, we bless you for your faithfulness, your goodness, your kindness. Danny's busy. Danny's up a bouncy castle somewhere. So, so we're going to receive it. Be blessed. Enjoy. Hang around. Say a word to somebody. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.